Hey there, guys. Welcome back to another episode of Generation Tech. My name is Alan. Harrison Dula, she's a bona fide war hero. She didn't join up after the Battle of Endor when all the hard fighting had already been done. She didn't join up after the Battle of Yavin when people started believing in the rebel cause. Nah, she signed up right from the very beginning. Heck, it could be argued that she started fighting against the Imperial occupation the second those clones on Ryloth that she and her father trusted turned against the Twilight people. I mean, yes, her father was a Clone Wars hero and a revolutionary figure. Not all daughters of famous historical figures follow in their father's footsteps. Some become DJs or social media influencers, YouTubers, other meaningless things like that. And you can't really blame them. I mean, it's hard to you know, start a revolution and also raise a child at the same time. Hera's first act of defiance would naturally be in the cockpit of a stolen Imperial shuttle during the initial occupation of Ryloth by the Empire. She and the clone Omega would create chaos over a Twilight Force labor camp, crash into many things, create some explosions, and I think it only added to her love and fascination with flying. In other words, she was born to be a pilot. Now this is 19 BBY, mind you. The Galactic Civil War was not a thing, it hadn't even started yet. And it wouldn't truly start until 2 BBY with the official establishment of the Alliance to Restore the Republic. And by that time, Harrison Dula had been holding down the rebellion for everyone else for like 17 years. Now, she's the person, she's the friend you leave at the Cheesecake Factory waiting for the uh, table reservation while everyone else walks around the mall looking at things. And during those 17 years, Harrison Dula saw some crazy stuff. The early rebellion was desperate, underfunded, undermanned, but they smelled bad, just like the inside of a Cheesecake Factory. And so it was a daily struggle to survive. Harris saw a lot of people die. But she kept on fighting, working hard to protect her family, the Spectre unit, making huge sacrifices to preserve her clan, Phoenix Squadron. And eventually, because of her efforts, the rebellion would grow into something far more concrete, better organized, better funded, and better positioned to win the war against the Empire. Harris and Dula, who selflessly gave up everything in her life for the rebellion, but also lose the love of her life, Kanan Jarrus, because of a lack of safety regulations at the Imperial Fuel Refinery on Lothal. Also, hooking up on top of a giant fuel tank with your loved one is, is probably not a good idea. Even when she found out that Kanan had left her with a child, like inside of her, she never stopped fighting. Even after Lothal was liberated, Harris and Dula just joins the wider rebellion without a thought. And so by the time we see General Harrison Dula at this briefing in 9 ABY, she's been fighting this war against the Empire for more than 28 years. That's older than a lot of you guys viewing this at home. Hera had no choice but to be a warrior for all of her life, and unfortunately it left her relatively unprepared for peacetime, for the politics she would get involved with. As a high-ranking officer, Harris and Dula had to deal with bureaucracy on a daily basis, especially in a civilian-led military. Which leads to the scene where Harris and Dula tries to brief Mon Mothma and a group of senators about the threat of Morgan Elspeth and her attempt to bring back Thrawn. And I gotta say, uh, you know, this scene was hard for me to watch. You know, out of all the characters and rebels, Harris and Dula is always my favorite. Maybe it's because of that sexy French or Middle Eastern accent she gets when she's angry, but it's also how much she sacrifices to the rest of the team for the Spectres. While everyone else gets to have fun and act silly, Hera's the one who makes sure everyone gets fed and everyone makes it home alive. She had to grow up way too soon and she never gave herself time to enjoy things, to enjoy life. I think she's one of the most selfless characters in that show. And I guess at least she was rewarded with the rank of general. You can be a general in the Rebel Navy. I know it's confusing, it's a Star Wars thing. And, but in this meeting, all that sacrifice doesn't mean anything. Even when she brings legitimate evidence to the senators about Imperial sympathizers in the heart of the New Republic shipbuilding industry. My investigation into the attack on the Vesper led me to the Sante shipyards on Corellia, where I was attacked by Imperial loyalists still working for Morgan Elspeth. Outliers. We have former Imperials working throughout every level of the New Republic government. I mean, what these senators are really saying is ever since the New Republic took over, they lacked about a few billion administrators, managers, accountants, you know, professionals. The actual people who ran all of the government agencies that made sure that the hyperspace lanes weren't clogged up with purgle shirts. The senator is a politician, and good politicians have less time for ideology and are just focused on trying to make things work. They care about compromise more than anything else. And let me tell you, running a galaxy after a four-year galactic civil war is not easy. And so, 
You look the other way when that uh, factory foreman has an Imperial battle flag in his locker because he's a good foreman. And they have all taken an oath of loyalty. Long live the Empire doesn't sound like the kind of loyalty we're looking for. Harrison Duell obviously can't see things the same way. Everything is way too personal, too real for her. How can they still be loyal to the Empire? Ahsoka, who's had time to shadow politicians like Padme and interact with a wider range of people during the Clone Wars, understands these individuals' motives a bit better. It's not loyalty. It's greed. Although being an elite Jedi and having superpowers meant that she rarely ever had a struggle to make ends meet. Even while in exile during Order 66, she had useful talents which she could make money with. What Ahsoka and Hera don't understand is that it's not just about greed or loyalty. I mean, it is for some of these people, but for most people, it's just you know some, some extra credit so that they can put some better food on their table for their family. Now, Hera is convinced that Morgan Elspeth and her people are trying to bring Thrawn back, but the reality is she doesn't have real solid proof of this. And while she's more strategic and tactical than Sabine Ren would be or a younger Ahsoka, Hera is still a bit naive on how politics works. She doesn't know how to and probably won't stoop down to the level of political monsters like Senator Giono to get what she wants. And so she makes mistakes. Yes, but I believe their activity speaks to a larger operation. It always does. Involving Thrawn. Grand Admiral Thrawn. But how is that possible? He disappeared years ago. I have reason to believe he is alive. And that his allies are working on a way to find him. You are certain of this? If I could get approval to send a task force to the Denap system, I could find out. Hera knows never to get involved in combat situations without your ship fully fueled and your weapons rack full of proton torpedoes. And when you go into a political battle asking for something, well, you also can't go in empty-handed. You need proof, you need evidence. You need to be able to defend your position and do it very well. You know how much a Mon Calamari cruiser costs to fuel up and supply for a one-day mission? How about all these supporting picket ships, escorts, starfighters? How many crew are we talking about here? It's an astronomical cost. And yes, I know, what's the point of a Navy if you don't use it? But this is a civilian-run military. And hold on, that's not a bad thing, actually. The Imperial military is run by a bunch of oligarchs, sycophants, and madmen, which is how they got destroyed by a bunch of moisture farmers and contraband smugglers driving the Star Wars equivalent of souped-up econo line vans. You need opposition in your military. You need civilians questioning the military within reason and with respect, of course. But for any organization to be properly run, you do need opposition. And these senators, they were elected by the people. And what the people really want right now after four years of war is uh, efforts to rebuild their homes, maybe uh, stimulate the economy, create jobs so that people can get back on track. What these senators are looking at is a leather jacket clad war hero who most likely is just chasing ghosts from a previous war in the Outer Rim. General, be honest. Isn't this just another attempt to gain New Republic resources to aid in what has ultimately been your personal quest to find Ezra Bridger. The second Shiono mentions Ezra Bridger, we all know it's bait. But Harrison Dula is a warrior. She's not one of these generals who's also a politician. And so she marches right into this trap. Ezra vanished while fighting Thrawn. And that you conveniently use a threat of Thrawn's return to acquire those resources that could be put to a more practical purpose, helping the people of our fledgling republic. Senator Giono actually reminds me of a legendary senator from the New Republic known as Bors Fela. He was a slimy political operator who would eventually go on to become the Chancellor of the New Republic, and he would actually lead the New Republic against the Yuzang Bomb. And like Giono is, unlikable as he was, as much of a political monster as he was, in his heart he actually was a patriot for the New Republic, and he would go down like a badass. I mean, his heart was ultimately in the right place. And this is an apt lesson about the political world, especially people new to the political system. It's easy to say that every senator, every politician is evil and, and, and they're terrible, but politics are necessary evil that allows our legislators to organize and negotiate for power. The alternative would just be an authoritarian dictator who tells everyone what to do, which is always going to lead to worse results. To act holier than thou by rejecting the political system, by pretending like it's beneath them, that's just the populist move and it's disingenuous in its own way. I mean, as dirty as the system is, as dirty as it makes people like Senator Giono, 
without this kind of politics, nothing would actually work. And the New Republic, again, is all about economic growth, and it actually reminds me a lot of Europe post the fall of the Iron Curtain. Tired of war, tired of so-called war-mongering nations like Poland or the United States and their infatuation on Putin being evil, you know, European nations focused on economic growth, and they developed, you know, really wonderful societies from the 90s to the 2000s. But we're not for, you know, everyday Ukrainians standing up against the imperial invasion made by the Russian Federation. Who knows what would have happened? Would Europe have been prepared for an open war against Russia? I think they would have been as ready as the New Republic. And I can't blame them because economic growth has always been the Republic's strategy. The Old Republic never kept a large standing military. Their peacetime economy always took a while to retool into a military industrial complex, but when it was done, they always overwhelmed the Sith Empire, outproduced them, outbuilt them, and eventually, the Republic would always prevail. And that is really the viewpoint that Western Europe has always taken, you know, especially thanks to organizations like NATO. I mean, realistically, the Russian Federation's economy is smaller than Germany, smaller than the UK's, it's even smaller than France, it's barely larger than Italy. And that's the result of Putin's poor economic decisions, rampant corruption and graft. I mean, Russia should be a mighty country, it should have an economy four times the size that it does have. Which is why having civilians run your military, which is why having opposition, a republic, is far superior to an authoritarian society. Which is why despite its perceived weakness, the new republic fleet, despite all these talks of demilitarization, is still pretty damn robust. I mean, look at this fleet. We did a breakdown of these new republic cruisers in another video, and their capabilities are quite good for what they need. And with Emperor Palpatine's contingency plan purposely making the Imperial Remnant look like a bunch of chickens with their heads cut off running around in circles, uh, it's very obvious why these New Republic Senators don't see the Empire as a threat anymore. General Sindula, I'm sure we are all grateful for your service and role in restoring the Republic. Now we, as Senators, serve the people of that Republic, and I can tell you, they want no part of any further conflict. And again, this is a good thing. You ultimately do want civilians dictating what the military does instead of the other way around. Then you would just have coups all the time. In this situation, Harrison Dula lets her emotions get the best out of her. Senator Jono's personal attacks had strategic value. They're designed to make Harrison Dula look emotional and too personally attached to this mission to be objective. And instead of, you know, backing down and calming down, Harrison Dula goes into attack mode. Were you ever in the war, Senator? No. I know some of you at home are like, oh, got him. Awesome. But remember, what's her goal here? It's not, not to like win some exchange of insults. It's to get support for a military action that is extremely important. She needs to stop a dangerous witch from using her magic from summoning a magical blue man from another galaxy. Kind of sounds dumb when I say it like that, right? But anyway, it's not about getting one over Senator Ass hat over here. And when you're a general officer, you're obligated to not get heated and not lose your cool. It's your job to fight for your men. It's your job to swallow that ego, to fight for your men, get them the best supplies, best support possible, to save as many lives as possible. And Harrison Dulles, you really screwed this up. And you can see it on Mon Mothma's face. Just sat back and waited to see who came out on top. I mean, how many other senators here have not served in the Rebel Alliance? Hera's turning everyone against her. As much as I love her, she's an idiot for doing this. She should have just taken the wedge until he's route and never gotten promoted past captain. You know, stay in the field piloting ships, which she loved doing, where she can stay away from all of these politicians. And in a last ditch effort to kind of save this meeting, what does she do? She doesn't use logic or, or represent facts or try to rationalize why this mission is important. She actually leans in on her personal connection to this mission, which is so stupid. Thrawn is not your typical Imperial officer. I know because I fought against him. He killed friends, people who were like family to me. I've spent most of my life fighting a war, and that's why I'm trying to convince you to help me prevent another one. Grand Admiral Thrawn is dead. And I'm sorry to say, it is my opinion that your friend, Ezra Bridger, heroically died with him. You don't know that. General, 
It's easy for us, the audience, to take Harrison Duell aside because we know exactly what she's talking about. We've seen uh, Morgan Elsbeth and her witchcraft. But for these senators, all they're seeing is, again, an emotional war veteran who seems to be chasing her past. And it's, it's, it's heartbreaking to see this. It really is. I mean, during the war, Harrison Duell had nerves of steel. She was beloved by her men and respected by her enemies. She was a giant. She was an important person. She was a hero, but now, you know, watching her get reduced to this emotional wreck, this unstable person, it just doesn't seem right. And yes, Harrison Duell personally saved Mon Mothra from the clutches of the Empire. And these two are always gonna watch each other's back. But right now, Harrison Duell is making Mon Mothra's job 20 times more difficult than necessary. Hera, allow me a moment to speak with my colleagues. Of course. Chancellor. I have no doubt that Mon Mothma will go back and try to reword Harrison Dula's harsh statements into something more politically expedient. Maybe Mon Mothma will get some support after all. I, probably, I doubt it. But even Mon wouldn't last that long in this political system, and once she retires just a few years later due to sickness, the New Republic would fall into partisan bickering. Individuals like Hera, like Princess Leia, would be the subject of smear campaigns. New legislators and politicians who weren't even born during the Galactic Civil War will make fun of warriors like this, who they deem as dinosaurs, caught up in a past age where barbaric wars and conflicts were still being fought. The end of history, this new generation will claim, democracy has defeated everything. But we all know that republics, democracy, it, it takes constant maintenance, constant vigilance to protect. And for Harrison Duel, things get even worse. Instead of waiting for approval from the military command, Harrison Duel basically commandeers a squadron of X-Wings and goes and tries to stop Morgan Elspeth all by herself. And during this incident, she actually loses two X-Wings and potentially gets two pilots killed. There's probably gonna be a review board. She's probably gonna get court-martialed unless she just runs away to the next galaxy. It's probably the better move at this point. But it's sad it had to come to this. I don't blame the New Republic, I certainly don't blame Harrison Dula, but this is just how things work out sometimes. We need warriors like Harrison Dula in our society. And not just when the enemy is knocking on our doors, but also in times of peace. I mean, how can we cast aside these warriors simply because they just remind us of the wars we asked them to fight in the first place? We begged individuals like Harrison Dula to save us, to protect us from tyranny, from, from the enemy. This is one of the greatest injustices we see in this period of Star Wars history. And it's injustice we see in our real world after many wars have been fought and won or lost. At the end of the day, it's always the veterans who are not able to reacclimate to society because of what we've asked of them.